Welcome back. In this, the seventh update that I have on my data for 2017, I'd like to talk about the definition of a good business and how it plays out with the numbers as I see them at the start of 2017. If you ask most people what a good business was, what a successful business was, most people would define it as a business that makes money. Making profits is considered to be the sign of a good business. That's not a bad place to start, but it's not a good place to end. And here's why. For a business to be successful, it's not just enough that it makes money, but it has to make enough money. Enough money to do what? To, co to compensate the owners of the business who've invested capital for the capital that they've invested in the business, for the risk that they've been exposed to in the context of, ru of running that business, and finally, for the time value of money, for the fact that they might have to wait to get their cash flows of the business. So good, a good business should be one that is not just profitable, but profitable enough to cover what you'd have made on an otherwise similar investment of equivalent risk. Now that's easier said than done, because in practice you face two challenges. One is, how do you measure the returns that a company is actually making on its existing businesses? And second, what do you compare it to? In my last session, I actually looked at the cost of capital as a comparison point. But let's focus now on how you measure returns to a business. The number that is most widely used today in practice, at least for non-financial service companies, is called the return on invested capital. And here's what it's measured as. It's the operating income, net of taxes, times one minus the tax rate, divided by the invested capital in the business. What's the invested capital? It's a book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash and other cross holdings that might not be part of operations. Now, so why are we doing this? Here's what you're hoping to measure with each of these numbers. With the operating income, your, uh, uh, the operating income after taxes, you're trying to measure what the business, what the company is making on its existing investments. Well, what you might actually be measuring is the accountant's measure of income, which is not really congruent often with the profits, the, the economic, or the, the, profit, the operating profits on the existing investments. When you look at invested capital and you use book value, here's what you hope you're capturing. You hope you're capturing what was originally invested in these projects. You're hoping that shows up in the book value. But here again, what you might actually see might not be a measure of what you originally invested in those projects, but what the accountant tells you is an updated number for it. Here's, what I, here's why this can be problematic. This is one of the few measures in finance where what dependent on accountants for both a numerator and a denominator. Operating income is an accounting number. Book value of equity and book value of debt are definitely accounting numbers. A year ago when I did my update, I actually looked at some of the reasons you should be careful about using this measure as your measure of what a company is actually making. There can be accounting issues. Accountants are not always consistent about the way they classify some expenses, like leases and R&D. It could be the fact that operating income, even though it's not supposed to have this embedded in it, might have some abnormal numbers, things that either push up earnings or push down earnings. It could also be that if you're catching a company early in its life cycle, what you're measuring as a return on capital and existing investments is not a fair measure of what this company can actually make across its lifetime. So if you catch a toll road company, the year after they built the toll road, the return on capital is going to look abysmal because they've invested the capital to build the toll roads, but they haven't started making money yet. And in the denominator, whatever accountants do to affect book value can affect your return on invested capital. So accounting write-offs, where accountants take bad investments and bad bad projects and take them off the books, actually cut in the way of you trying to figure out whether your company is making good investments because if you keep taking your mistakes off the books, I can come to the conclusion that you're taking good projects when in fact you're taking a lot of bad projects but just writing them off. Again, the same accounting classification issue can mean that the capital investment projects is not fully captured in the book value. With technology firms, for instance, the fact that R&D is expense means that the book value of equity for a technology company is understated. And finally, if you have high inflation, it can wreak havoc on both your book value and your accounting income. In fact, if you have high inflation and I don't adjust the book value for inflation, your return on capital can look astonishingly big, not because you're taking good projects, but because of the inflation effect. So with those caveats, let me talk a little bit about how I compute return on invested capital for the 42,668 companies that were in my sample in January 2017. Given the size of the sample, I have to make some approximations. I have to use a bludgeon rather than a scalpel. So here are the numbers that I use to come up with my return on invested capital for each company. 
for the operating income, I started with the earnings before interest and taxes over the trailing 12 months. What do I mean by that? January 1st of 2017, the most recent 12 months are probably the 12 months ending in September 30th of 2016. That's out of my hands. That's what I use as my trailing 12 months starting number. I do adjust that number for leases and R&D. In fact, I try my best to correct the accounting mistake. So I capitalize leases. I convert them to debt. And when I convert them to debt, my operating income has to get restated. I capitalize R&D. And when I do that, treat it as a capital expense. Again, my operating income is adjusted. So I start with the trailing 12-month numbers and I adjust them for leases and R&D. Now, of course, since some companies around the world don't report their lease commitments, I don't adjust their numbers. And that's a limitation that comes from the data. For the book value, those same lease and R&D adjustments go into my book value. But for the book value of equity and debt, I use the book value of equity and debt as of the most recent quarter, at the end of the most recent quarter, which is probably the third quarter of 2016 for many of these companies. And I adjust that number for capitalized leases and capitalized R&D. So for technology companies, my invested capital will be much higher than what you see on their books. I then net out the cash and the marketable securities that these companies report at the end of the most recent quarter. I also net out goodwill, and here's why I do that. Goodwill, of course, shows up in acquisitions, and if you're buying a high-growth company, it shows up in goodwill. I'm effectively taking out that goodwill, hoping that it's really for that growth assets, which are not captured in your operating income. It's a shortcut I'm using, but again, with 42,668 companies, I don't get a chance to finesse this number. I end up with a return in invested capital for each of the 42,668 companies. Now, of course, you can take issue with the measurement choices I've made, but I'm going to let the law of large numbers work in my favor as I look at how these numbers play out across the globe. Now, to think about how I'm going to use this number, I'm going to compare it to what I need to make. Now, with the return on invested capital, the appropriate hurdle rate to compare it to is the cost of capital. The cost of capital captured in the same currency, and we talked about why currencies matter, and on investments of equivalent risk. That's why I adjust the cost of capital for the risk of the business you're in and the mix of debt and equity you have. So if I'm looking at return on capital, the appropriate hurdle rate becomes the cost of capital. If I'm looking at return on equity, the appropriate hurdle rate becomes the cost of equity. So that becomes my measure of excess return on projects. And I compute that for all of the companies in my sample. And here's what the world looks like. Out of the 42,668 companies, I lost a few thousand for which I could not get either the invested capital or operating income. Among the companies for which I could get a return invested capital and I could compare to the cost of capital, the world looks pretty depressing from an investment standpoint. About 63% of all my companies in 2016 earn less than the cost of capital. Don't jump to the conclusion that they're all bad companies. These might be young companies. There's a mix of factors there, but it's still not a good number. There are about 10,947 companies that earn more than 2% more than their cost of capital. So think of these as the value creators. About 4,100 companies earn within 2% of the cost of capital. Think of them as running in place. And about 19,960 companies earn 2% or more less than their cost of capital. So these are the value destroyers. There are a lot more value destroyers than value creators, at least based on 2016 return invested capital. So what does this all mean? I decided to take a look at excess returns as they varied across the globe. I, I don't want you to read too much into this picture, but this is a picture of what the excess returns on average look like for non-financial service companies around the world. Why non-financial service? Well, return invested capital and cost of capital are problematic with financial service companies. It makes more sense to compare return in equity to cost of equity. But if you look at the world as it stands in January 2017, no surprise here. There are very few sections of the world that are green. These are the parts of the world where companies earn more than their cost of capital. You see the U.S., you see India, you see pockets in Africa. But don't get too excited about these pockets. Many of these countries have two or three or five companies in the sample. You see sections of Europe which have, which have green in them. But a big part of the world is pink or red. There are large segments of the world, large portions of the world, where companies earn below their cost of capital, and have done so for a while. Australia and New Zealand, for instance, in Canada, have returns in capital which are less than the cost of capital. But there you could argue, actually, that they have an excuse. They're disproportionately natural resource companies, and commodity prices were not that good in 2015 and 16. 
But I, I, again, rather than read too much into this table, I've just compared excess returns regionally. And this might be a good starting point for a discussion of why excess returns vary across regions of the world and what we as investors can do to improve that difference. So that said, let's take a closer look at, at sectors or industries. I compute the return on capital and cost of capital for each industry, for about 94 industries, and I do this globally, I do this by region. Looking globally across companies, here's what I see. Here are my worst businesses in 2016, and I'm defining worst as businesses where the return on capital is below the cost of capital. I compute the return on capital at an aggregate level for each of these businesses. I add up all the operating income, I add up all of the invested capital, and the reason I do that is I'm not letting outliers drive my averages. I am, in a sense, waiting for bigger companies. If you look at this list, a large percentage of this list con is composed of natural resource companies. Again, I'm not saying these are bad businesses, but their returns on 2016 were not good, that good. And their excuse might be, their defense might be, it's a bad year for commodity prices. But there are some businesses like steel, shipbuilding, you know, maybe even new 30s. We could argue that this is a function of where these businesses are in the life cycle, that these are businesses where coming out of the excess returns is going to be much more difficult to do. Now, looking at the other end of the spectrum, these are the businesses that look like they're the best businesses. Again, some of this may come from true competitive advantages in these businesses. Some can, can come from the way in which invested capital gets mismeasured in these businesses. But you notice soft, soft drinks, beverages, the brand name effect kind of allows these companies to earn well above their cost of capital. But a lot of low capital intensity businesses on this list. You can see the entire list if you're interested. If you click on the data attachment, I will put to this this session but those are the differences across industries now what do I get out of all of this I think the lesson I get out of looking at these numbers across all of these companies is there are far more bad companies than we realize in fact you could argue that 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 it's more that it's easier to find a bad company than a good one that it's in fact the good businesses that are unusual not the bad ones which actually has some added resonance when you think about growth. We tend to think of growth as a good thing, but growth is not a good thing at those companies that consistently earn less than their cost of capital. Furthermore, many of these bad companies have stayed bad for an extended period, and here's, I think, the most depressing part. The managers of these businesses either are don't know they're in bad businesses because they're ignorant or in denial about being in bad business and keep investing in it, or just don't care. And that's why I think these pictures should be posters for corporate governance. To me, the essence of corporate governance is you get a chance to ask managers tough questions, and sometimes when they don't respond to those questions to replace them. If, uh, if we don't do much about corporate governance, we shouldn't be surprised to see companies in bad businesses stay bad and actually throw more money into those bad businesses. I hope you found this session useful and you've enjoyed it. Thank you very much for listening.